Today on the Everything 80s podcast, we're going to look at how the boombox or the ghetto blaster, as you may know it, forever changed music. Hey there, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out today. Not only was it the must-have accessory if you wanted to take your music on the go, but it is also responsible for the rise of hip-hop culture. The Ghetto Blaster, or Boombox, was a portable music player and transistor that had at least one cassette deck. You could record and play music on them, with the large ones producing a massively high volume. They became part of urban culture and played a key role in the launch and evolution of hip-hop. And that's what we're going to look at today. You can picture it now, the giant ghetto blaster, possibly hooked up to a car battery, maybe hugely distorted, (laughs) not good bass. Some were amazing. Um, They were like a focal point of your sort of status, you know, before kids could have cars or anything like that. Again, if you grew up in the 80s, people walking around with the radio or their boombox was, again, just this ultimate status symbol. But before we look at all this, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. Okay, let's do it. So before Alexa, before Siri, before Bluetooth or any of those portable speakers, there was, of course, the Ghetto Blaster or the Boombox. And as I was mentioning at the start, it wasn't just used to play music. It was a statement. The the Boombox was an identity that showed who you were, the music you liked, and the culture you were a part of. And again, they also looked aggressive as hell and intimidating. The bigger the boombox, the bigger the persona. And they became mainstays at any outdoor event. Basically, you could take the party with you and everyone could hear it. It was part instrument, you know, part status symbol and also, you know, part cultural identity. I wanted a boombox or a ghetto blaster more than life itself, but I would never be able to get one. I probably, even if if I had one of those amazing ones, I don't think I would have had the guts to even take one out in public. So in the 80s, I I loved hip hop. I loved the growth and and this expansion of this brand new art form. It it just, it totally resonated with me. Um, You know, maybe I wasn't as hardcore into it, obviously being younger, but I loved the classics, you know, Run DMC and LL Cool J and Cool Mo D and Ice T. But at the same time, I was also listening to a lot of that, you know, novelty hip hop like Young MC or MC Hammer or DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. And that, you know, that was probably what I gravitated to more. And that probably wouldn't have gone over well blasting it from a boombox at any block party. I ended up getting a boombox eventually, but it was more like one of those boomboxes that have been hit by a shrinking ray. You know, those black Casio type ones that were very non-threatening and used um, probably the amp power of a small coughing church mouse. The real boom boxes, however, have a history that goes back into the 1970s before they became more prominent in the 80s. So I think the first thing is to act like if you can't picture a boom box or ghetto blaster, you're going to have to do a quick Google images search, but I'm sure you have a decent idea of what I'm talking about, but there's actually some specific components that technically make up a boom box. So it must have at least two loudspeakers, an amplifier, a radio tuner, and a cassette player. You wrap all this up in a plastic or metal case, slap a handle on it, and you're ready to go. All good boom boxes can be powered by AC or DC cables, but can still run off batteries. So you may, you remember probably those odd giant ones I was talking about that could be powered off of a car battery. That was like the next level boombox, just you know beyond anything comprehensible. Differentiates a boombox or get a blaster from a tape player is that it's made of metal or, or at least has that chrome look to it. This was the main design of boomboxes in the 80s. Thanks to Sony, black became more of the aesthetic for technology going into the late 80s and 90s. So the golden age of boom boxes would have that metal look to them. Then I just touched on the battery issue. Boom boxes were notorious battery hogs and the bigger ones would require up to 10 D batteries. Remember how big those were? 10 D batteries could make some of those units weigh up to 26 pounds. Speaking of the car battery, some units could take a sealed 12 volt lead acid battery or 
be swapped out for what was under your dad's hood back then. So here's the first boomboxes and ghetto blasters. Various forms of portable radios have gone back to the late 1930s, but the first boombox as we know it was created by Philips in 1966. It was called the radio recorder. And it was the first time a machine had a tape player that could record off the radio. The sound quality was pretty sketchy, but at the same time, boomboxes were being developed in Japan. The Japanese versions were more innovative and had better technology and sound. As the late 70s rolled around, different manufacturers were fine-tuning what a boombox could be. Companies like Sony, Panasonic, and GE were creating a great crossover between a home stereo and a portable radio. The main thing that all these different models had in common was their ability to crank out volume. Besides having an AM FM tuner, the biggest inclusion, which was fundamental to the rise of hip hop, was the adding of input and output jacks. This meant things like microphones and turntables could be plugged into them. What you now had was a portable television studio. Sorry, that's Doc Brown, Back to the Future. What you now had was a portable concert that had enough volume for an entire street. I really want to focus on the the boombox and the rise of hip hop because a lot of people overlook this, but it was instrumental in the growth of this new genre. And this is probably due to cassette tapes. Cassettes existed in a post vinyl pre CD era and a lot of music, especially hip hop was traded around by cassette. Cassettes were perfect. They were small, transportable, cheap, and sounded okay. I mean, we didn't really have a lot to compare them to. I mean, probably as good as vinyl some would disagree there's more warmth with vinyl but in a pre you know cds weren't as common obviously no digital music so we had nothing really to compare it to as far as proper quality so to us they sounded as good as could possibly be the only problem of course with the tape was the dread of the tape coming out and having to use a pencil to wind it back in if you're under 30 you probably have to ask your parents about that one the other other amazing thing with cassettes is that you could now record yourself and make your own music this could be as simple as singing into the microphone of a tape player you couldn't do that with vinyl you couldn't do that with a track cassettes basically meant that you could create your own home recordings and not necessarily have to go to a professional studio they weren't going to sound professional but you could at least put something down and had the opportunity to be creative that didn't really exist before in in music and, and in like home music, again, without having to go to a proper recording studio or knowing someone that had proper recording equipment, like reel-to-reel actual tape recording equipment. Um, so unless you had that, you were kind of stuck. So you could, you know, make your own songs and be able to perform them, but you had no way to put them down and to actually um, have them as a recording. DJs use the advent of cassettes to now be able to record any of their live sessions and performances. These tapes could now be spread around specifically New York City after hip hop started emerging in the Bronx. You could record straight from the mixing board at any party or from in your own room right into your tape deck on your boombox or ghetto blaster. Basically, if it wasn't for cassettes, hip hop would not have been able to have been easily spread around New York. Hip hop was brand new in the early 80s. And if you lived in other parts of New York, the only time you might have heard it was if someone happened to get their hands on a cassette from a party or performance. Hip hop captured the imagination of so many people and the ghetto blaster or boombox allowed for those live performances to be taken and played anywhere. Here's just, you know, also the quick backstory on hip hop itself and how it emerged. I recommend watching um, Hip Hop Evolution on Netflix, who's hosted by a guy named Shad, who's from my hometown, who's one of the most brilliant MCs you'll ever hear. And the entire series is a look into the evolution of hip hop. And the, 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 the basic backstory is, again, hip hop starting in the Bronx with a guy named DJ Cool Herc. And the way hip hop sort of has its roots is in a lot of like, you know, funk records, um, some R&B stuff, a lot of James Brown and specifically the parts in the music where they call uh, the break where there's no uh, singing or vocals. And a lot of the other instruments usually drop out and you're usually left with the drums and the bass, you know, maybe a few other things, but those are called the breaks. And uh, they tend to be a little more, a little more funkier, a little more hard hitting because again, everything sort of stripped down into that basic form, which is kind of at the roots of hip hop. Also where you get the name break dancers from because they would dance to these breaks. So what DJs were figuring out specifically DJ cool Herc was if you had two turntables, 
um, say the the break in uh, what a particular song is like 20 seconds. But usually at parties, especially with like James Brown songs, think of the song like Funky Drummer, and you can probably picture that break in there. Uh, that would usually get the crowd going and everyone dancing, but they only lasted 20 seconds. So DJ Cool Herc realized you could get two copies of the same record and then have one queued up at the break. So when the first break on the first record stops, you immediately go into the same break on the second record and then you can go back and forth. So a 20 second break could be extended into like three minutes. One of the most important songs in hip hop's history is a song called Apache. And it was originally... Uh, by a group called The Shadows, which is a guitar band. I think that was Cliff Richard and The Shadows, like way back in the 60s, maybe even late 50s. Forgive me on that one. But it had this, again, this sort of, um, because it was all guitar-based, it had these sort of cool breakdowns um, and sort of guitar little instrumentals. And then this whole song was covered by a group called The Incredible Bongo Band, which was all that. It was just straight instrumental bongos. And they created or recreated this Apache sound specifically with these long little stretches of breaks that were, again, that that sort of stripped down beat. I can't, I don't think I can technically play it. So that's why I'm not going to put this, uh, the clip up just so this doesn't get flagged for any copyright stuff, even though I think it is allowed under the free right usage. Whatever. I'm hoping you can picture this. If not, go to YouTube or whatever and just look up Apache Incredible Bongo Band. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about, about the specific break. And this is one of, this is just like this random record from the 70s or whatever. But the break in it, um, this famous break again, which has been used more times than probably any other song in the history of hip hop, had this just awesome beat and groove with the bongos and the drums. And DJ Cool Herc had found this album just sort of, you know, flipping through stuff. It's kind of like of a throwaway little album. And loved the break and started playing them at these uh, Bronx, like, apartment parties. And people would go ballistic for it. And so, again, with that, using that same uh, technique, he would take uh, two copies of that Apache record and be able to extend that break for three, four, five minutes just because people would be losing their mind. Again, also giving rise to break dancers dancing on the, the break beat. So as far as it comes to hip hop, a lot of these DJs started playing, you know, block parties and stuff like that. And they would want to be able to announce their next shows or where they were playing or whatever. So they were still playing a lot of records that had vocals and everything. It wasn't all just the breakbeats and instrumentals because people still wanted to hear the big time songs, but they would use the breakbeat parts um, and extending them. So they would be able to announce their next gigs or anything like that. And they obviously were able to do this because there was no vocals, you know, going over top of them. So then this also led the rise to the master of ceremonies or the MC who would take it upon himself to, again, do the work for the DJ and announce the next party and where it was going to be and everything like that. And then, you know, to sort of give it a little bit of showmanship, they sort of embellished that time on the microphone. And that sort of gave rise to putting little phrases together. And that would lead to, you know, rhyming some some things. And that would lead to full-on rhymes over these breakbeats. And that's really the origins of hip-hop. And like I said, now with the ability to record stuff like that, they could send out, uh, the, you know, the announcements on cassette of the next thing. And But then now these MCs were wanting to showcase uh, their abilities to, you know, to rhyme and to sort of express themselves. And they could put that onto cassette and spread it around. And then that gave uh, more rise to people wanting to compete against one another to show their skills. And then that leading to freestyle battles, which is also at the core of hip hop. Basically, if it wasn't for cassette tapes and and the boombox, I don't know if hip hop, I'm sure it would have spread, but I don't know if it would have grown as fast or actually even got out of the, the, the Bronx as much. It might have stayed a more regional thing, but then it spread throughout the other boroughs through Queens and Manhattan and Staten Island. And then tapes were able to be sent, you know, to other cities and around the country. So I really do believe that it's the cornerstone of the, um, that entire genre. So as I mentioned, one of the first big hip hop acts was LL Cool J. And he was also, you know, 
really notable about expressing his love for the boombox. And he had a song called I Can't Live Without My Radio. If you remember, you might remember that or you might not, depending on your hip hop love. This came out in 1986. It not only spoke about how the boombox was part of life, but part of hip hop life. He actually names manufacturer JVC and used this song to share the importance of what the Ghetto Blaster meant to those in hip hop. Again, I wanted to play this clip I, th- I think I could have, but whatever, I'm not going to risk it. Here's a few lyrics to demonstrate it from this song. So it goes, I'm sorry if you can't understand, but I need a radio inside my hand. Don't mean to offend other citizens, but I kick my volume way past 10. My radio, believe me, I like it loud. I'm the man with a box that can rock the crowd. Walking down the street to the hardcore beat while my JVC vibrates the concrete. The other things with songs like this was they were specifically now recording songs that took advantage of the boombox that they knew they were going to be played on. So they put a lot more bass into their songs, especially like this one LL Cool J put out. Uh, These giant radios really now could pump out bass a lot. And again, since hip hop has a big focus on bass, the boombox was the perfect delivery system. The boombox was also a staple item to groups like the Beastie Boys and made appearances in movies like Fame and Flashdance. It also has an iconic appearance at the end of the movie Say Anything, where In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel plays over the head of character Lloyd Dobler. So we talked about, you know, the rise of hip hop and and taking parties um, and talents and MCs and and spreading their, their talents around. Here's a little more on the soundtrack to the streets that the the boombox provided. You know, thanks to it, quick parties, DJ nights, freestyle battles that I mentioned before, they could take place at any time and anywhere. You didn't need to set up speakers, mixers, cables, amps. I mean, you could do all that, but you didn't have to with these amazing boomboxes. You also didn't need any AC outlets. You just placed your boombox down and went at it that they would become one of the symbols of urban culture in the 80s. And as popular as, say, like the Walkman would get, the Walkman specifically catered to all kinds of music because now this was this personal device. You could listen to whatever you like. With the boombox, it was pretty much just about hip-hop and heavy metal. You weren't seeing boomboxes going down um, to play classical music or country or maybe you were somewhere. But again, this was part of like the urban landscape at the time. Again, with hip-hop, breakdance battles and MC battles were the main way to show your abilities amongst your peer. There, Again, there was no way to show your creativity back then. Um, there's no YouTube channel. There's no social media. If you wanted to show that you could actually rhyme, you had to showcase it in public. And the boombox allowed for this to happen. And then again, with cassette tapes, it allowed you, allowed you to record that and be able to share that with others. In the case of hip-hop, cities actually began to ban them in public places. They would become less acceptable in city streets, but their easy transportability meant the party could be picked up and quickly moved to a new location. Okay, let's look at the actual demise of the boombox or ghetto blaster. It's not that it the boombox faded because they got worse. Far from it. The technology got better, but it just wasn't capturing the spirit of what came before it. Like anything that makes a splash, including hip hop itself, it becomes a little mainstream and this can lead to it getting watered down. When you look at the second and third generation versions of objects, they start to add too many bells and whistles to avoid the risk of not being the latest and greatest. And this same issue faced the boombox. New additions came out with equalizers that probably actually didn't do anything, graphic displays, sound level indicator lights. I mean, they look like the dashboard of Kit from Knight Rider. Some boomboxes would be slapped with the label Jumbo on it in case you couldn't see for yourself how big this thing was. They, they then started adding CD players to them, and then the boombox started to merge to emerge as a high-tech device and far removed from the um, origins of what it once was. The height of the boombox would be in the mid to late 80s, but at this point, the stigma attached to them, the potential fines and issues of street noise violations made carrying a boombox a bit of a stigma. At this point, again, however, the Walkman was really coming to its own. You could at least still enjoy your music without disturbing anyone, and they were a lot cheaper. A Walkman only took two AA batteries and not 16 Giant D batteries or a car battery. The Walkman is interesting too, and I've done a show all about it, but it's interesting because it's the start of an era when music begins to go inward. Uh, 
it, it becomes private now. Whereas the boombox um, and record players, and they were all about outward music. They were all about sharing music and sort of like pushing it out there. Whereas the Walkman brought it inward. It would lead, of course, to the Discman, the MP3 player, the iPod, and then your phone, which you're probably listening to this on right now. And it is pretty much the only way we listen to music right now. Again, music now is a personal and private experience, which the Walkman helped solidify, where the boombox was more about community and gatherings and a shared experience. You can take that for what it is, for better or for worse, but an era definitely ended when the Walkman took over and the boombox faded away. You can also see this in the same way arcades fell by the wayside for private gaming at home. We lost that sense of community of course, the internet would help bring that back around again, which is what people are really striving for at the end of the day with any of this technology or movements or, you know, different eras. It, it all starts and is sort of centered around community. Let me start wrapping up here with some final thoughts. Again, the boombox still exists, but has evolved into a modern version of it. What used to be this giant thing that weighed 26 pounds you're now basically holding in your hand. The The phone has become not just a music player, but the device for all content rolled into one. I mean, your phone holds thousands of songs that can be ac- accessed instantly. Music continues to be that deeply personal experience, but, you know, you wonder if a time will return when people go back to that shared collective experience with portable music. Bluetooth speakers have helped this, though, because gatherings of people will always demand music. Some of these new Bluetooth devices even encompass designs of past ghetto blasters as a way to relive an era that most people never got to experience. But that's the story of the boombox or ghetto blaster, whatever you like to call it. Um, It was critical in the advent of hip hop and was a big part of the urban identity. Again, that bad stigma became attached to them and people were unfairly targeted, even though it was just about sharing their music. Music is a form of self-expression. So all the hate and laws surrounding boomboxes in public did have that ring of suppressing culture and personal identity. The boombox was the vehicle that launched a whole new art form and is no doubt this iconic and important symbol of the 1980s. So let's call it a day there. Hopefully you like this trip down memory lane, um, learn something new or just, you know, finally looking back on this, um, what seems like a simple era now, but uh, this big device that was so important in the shaping of um, an entire culture. But again, thank you for listening. If you haven't already, subscribe wherever you find your podcasts, um, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. I'm pretty much on all those different platforms. Uh, If you really like the show, give it a rating and review. That allows more people to get to check it out. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. I'll be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.